Dr. Mike, we are glad to see you in the framework of our project City as a Classroom. As an expert in political science and sociology, specializing in environmental sociology, mobilities and sustainable transport, one of your research focus on livable cities. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, which criteria characterize livable cities? That's a fairly broad question and, and, and um, you know, it would take a long time to answer, but essentially what the way I would answer that in the, in the short version would be a livable city is a city that focuses on its citizens and inhabitants and they are the priority over everything else. So in other words, when, when you talk about transport, when you talk about planning, when you talk about buildings, your, your, your main central focus should be on people. So it's people for cities are cities for people rather than cities for, for infrastructure or for transport or whatever. So it's a, it's a, it's a general focus on probably the, the micro level rather than the macro level of a city. So that's essentially a livable city is essentially one that will sustain or increase quality of life for the people who actually live there. So that's, that's probably the shortened version of that answer. Thank you. You have a long-standing interest in sustainability issues, especially in sustainable transportation. Mm -hmm. In your viewpoint, how mobilities of cities influence people? Well, well first and foremost, um, it, there's a growing body of research that would suggest how we build our cities can make people healthy, but alternatively, they can make people sick. So it's really important to sort of emphasize that. So it's not just something about the aesthetics of a city. The way a city is designed can decrease a person's health, both physical and mental. So in other words, if you design cities for cars, for instance, you have the added problem of the pollution, the noise or whatever. So that decreases um, people's physical health and it impacts upon them. If you force people away from walking and from cycling, you force them into a sedentary lifestyle of um, transporting in cars all the time, so they don't get the exercise that we as humans need. So, that, so I think that's very important to sort of say that, that um, the way we design our cities very much affects individual health. Um, and also, of course, within communities, the way we designed our, design our communities and our cities has a direct impact on people's mental well-being. So in other words, if, if, if you're able to sort of uh, go out into a park and meet your neighbours and, and talk with your neighbours, that is our innate human ability to communicate and we all need that ability and those uh, precious moments to communicate with each other. So that's really important as well. So if we do not provide those facilities, then we lose that sort of community effort. But we also lose very important things like uh, we, we diminish our social capital, for instance. And essentially what that means is if I don't know my neighbours, if I can't communicate with my neighbours, then I don't know my next door neighbour as a carpenter. So if I need something done, I, I cannot reach out to, the, to, to that neighbour. Alternatively, they can rely on me. That's, that's a social capital that's ex extremely important for, for community resilience is the way I'd put it as well. So in other words, that um, having that ability to, to not only know your neighbours, but to be able to communicate on a very human level is really important. And how we design cities and, and how we design our transport systems can facilitate those interactions and alternatively, can actually uh, diminish them. So if we're all in our cars and we're all in our little boxes, going in our own separate ways, we cannot really meet. Um, but if we're on public transport, if we're walking, if we're cycling, these are the serendipitous moments that we really need to sort of um, implant within our cities. You know? Thank you. You have a background in the area of technology. In your viewpoint, which diverse forms of technology are used in cities on a daily basis? 
Okay, so I, I do have a background in technology and um, I have a master's degree in IT as well. So I, I would regard myself as a technology guy. However, I'm sort of a bit of an outlier in that I'm also a critic of technology, particularly the way it's been um, developed, designed, and adopted right across society without due diligence to what its effects are. So we, we live in what I describe as a very technological determinist society. So in other words, we allow engineers, we allow technologists, we allow investment capitalists to create these technologies that's thrown out in society and the effects that they're having on society aren't truly recognized first and foremost and aren't treated in a way that they should. So in no other form of society would that be allowed. You know, we're, we're currently going through a pandemic, we say, for instance, and, and every vaccine has to be carefully tested. Yet we, we don't even consider that for our technologies, even though they have dramatic impacts upon us. So that's my position with regard to technology. But of course, I would be naive, I would be silly to say technology doesn't have a role to play. Of course it does. And we can see sort of great leaps in, in health and, and in how we live our lives, how we stay communicated together. And they're hugely positives. Um, but we must recognize some of the negatives. So, so within cities, I see it a lot. And I, and, and I, I, I recoil at this, this notion of what's called the smart city, for instance. And my first reaction would be smart for whom, you know, if it's a smart city, it should benefit the citizens of the city, the people that live there. But often it's just a way of allowing traffic management and allowing people sort of, uh, allow engineers sort of design the city, not around people, but around the infrastructure and the transport systems they have. So again, I come back to that first idea of a livable city. The focus moves away from the individual in a lot of these smart technologies. Um, how I do, of course, see them benefit, in the, you know, um, with regards to transport or whatever I see there, the idea of real-time transport apps or whatever, they're all extremely useful sort of uh, tools to have. But unfortunately, there, again, and I see this from, from, from a political sort of point of view, but also from uh, decision makers, particularly in, in authority and, and in, you know, metropolitan areas, where they believe that somehow the, that technology is some sort of a silver bullet. Somehow you throw a technology out there and it will cure everything. Now, real-time apps for public transport, for instance, are very useful, but they're useless if you don't have good public transport. So, so the idea that somehow the technology will fix the good public transport is, is counterproductive and nonsensical, really, you know. It's okay having real-time apps, but if no buses arrive, what's the point? So, so often the technology takes the focus away from where the real issues are, which are the fundamentals of a city anyway, and they cannot be cured by technology alone. Technology will, of course, play a role, but they cannot be cured by that technology. Thank you. In your work, the practices of technology, putting society and technology in their place, you question the role technologies are likely to play in promoting more sustainable forms of overconsumption. In your opinion, which role some technologies play in finding solutions to make cities better and in turn making people better? Again, I, I would come back to the emphasis of, of who designs a, a technology first and foremost, and what is their main driving motive. So, so, for instance, much of the technologies that we use today have been designed by very few individuals and have no oversight by any governmental or any agencies within government. So, in other words, people are allowed to create a technology and just throw it out there for good or for bad. And again, I, I, I come back to that idea that in, in no other sort of um, part of society is that allowed, you know, even within building a house, you need to have plans and you need to show its effects on the, on the aesthetics of a neighborhood and all that kind of stuff. But it, technology seems to be given a free reign. And I think, you know, ultimately that's sort of leading us down the wrong path. 
So um, with regard to sustainability, for instance, much of the technologies, much of the apps, much of, of what's occurring in technology um, sustains a consumer society, sustains and increases the consumer society, which runs opposite to what sustainability is. So the, the idea of sort of apps making it easier to shop online, for instance, is just sustaining a consumer society. And of course, the idea, and I was only reading the article on Amazon and Jeff Bezos, and in, during the pandemic in the first half of, the, uh, of, of this year, he, I think he, made a, he alone made a profit, not the company, he alone made 167 billion. So what that's doing is, first and foremost, is making him mega rich, almost untouchable, but at the same time, what it's doing to communities and towns and cities and villages, it's absolutely ruining them. So people who cannot shop in a central city shop anymore because it's no longer viable, they can get it cheaper online, that shop closes, becomes derelict. When, when, when there's no shopping in your area, well, then people will move out of the area. So you will hollow out cities by just allowing this free reign of, of libertarian consumer society um, run amok. So the long-term consequences of all these technologies have never really been thought out and, and, and the effects will only start to emerge maybe in the next decade or two. And it will be too late to turn back the clock then. So um, again, the emphasis on, on much of the, there, there has to be a stronger oversight over these technologies. In other words, when somebody develops a technology, they should have some plan and they should have some foresight as to its effects, both on society and the environment, the long-term environment. All you have is their economic goals. They want to make money from this kind of thing and they don't care of the consequences. So there should be more uh, heavier oversight with regards to the technologies that are, that are uh, rolled out because the consequences are real. They really are. And, and, and I can see some evidence in some countries at the moment that, you know, th this isn't just me saying it. I, it. Evidence is starting to emerge, but the long, the really heavy impacts won't emerge until maybe another decade or so. But it will be too late to turn back the clock then. Thank you so much. And the last question, as a sociologist, in what ways do you think a city can be our classroom? What we can and should learn while living our lives, our lives in city? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Something I, I always do myself um, with, with my classes. Um, I always endeavor to, whether it's transport or whether it's environment or, or any of these, I, I always take a day where we walk around the cities and, and, and I get people to observe and to look, to look at what's, what's actually happening. We often unconsciously sort of go through our urban environments without actually really appreciating what's going on. So it's only by, by pointing out to people, you know, even, you know, the, the, the simplest things of getting people to look up rather than looking at the eye level, see what's going on up there, but also to see how, you know, small bits of the public space is being taken away by, by car parking and stuff like that and, and, and noticing them. So, so city as a classroom is, you know, to me would be a very obvious part of any course, whether it be environmental, whether it be livable cities, whether it would be anything like that. So it's extremely important that sort of, um, that you connect what happens in the classroom with what's happening in real life. So that it's, it's in many ways, it's, it's standing outside the, the, the academy here and actually appreciating that what we're learning here is actually has real life consequences. Thank you so much, really. I really appreciate that you find time to speak with us in the framework of our cities.